Before we released this report to the public, we brought together a group of older adults. We got the report in their hands ahead of time and had them read it and just say, did we get this right? Did we cover it all? Do you think we're going in the right direction? Um, and I think overwhelmingly so, the group was really supportive. But a couple of things they said was, this is big. This is going to take more than one conversation. But they also said, come out to the community. You know, I've got my friends down the street, and I'd love for them to hear this. And mm-hmm. I've got my church, and I think church members would hear that. And so not only kind of this network of professionals, but I think we're doing a good job of engaging Um, you know, older adult ambassadors, where if they're the trusted person in the community and they say this report is important, you should hear from the auditor and age friendly, then we can go out and meet these smaller groups where they exist too. We are looking forward our way from Studio C in the 511 Studios in the Burr District, south of downtown Columbus. Today, Carol and I are meeting with two guests who have joined us in the past, always providing us with some great information. Uh, Today with it's going to be no exception. Uh, let me inter- introduce Franklin County Auditor Michael Stenziano, who has served as auditor for the past three years, as well as a member of the Columbus City Council for over six years, a member of the Ohio House of Representatives and legal counsel with McTyke and McGinnis for nearly 12 years. Our second guest is Katie White, Executive Director at Age Friendly Columbus and Franklin County. Katie is also the Director of Age Friendly Innovation Center and Age Friendly Communities Project, both at the Ohio State University's College of Social Work. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to see you. It's good to see all of everybody back here. We're always interested in what's going on with Age Friendly. And needless to say, we've had Auditor Stinziano on the hot seat over here with us before. So we're <laughs> glad you were willing to come back and see us again. It was a pretty good. cool seat. It wasn't that hot. Okay. I was going to say, it's, it's always a good sign when we, they want to come back. Yes, exactly. Because we were giving them a hassle about dog license last <laughs> time. So I think you love a hot seat. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so we do, we do want to thank both uh, of you. So in April of this year, a report was released by the Auditor's Office in partnership with Age-Friendly Innovation Center that is touching on a really hot topic for us to this at this point in time. Everyone is dealing with the housing crisis. Sales may be up, but we, we really don't have enough housing. It's not affordable. It's uh, just an ongoing inflationary issue. Those most challenged in this situation are our seniors. So today we're going to discuss this report, which is called Older Adults and Property Taxes, Findings and Recommendations in Franklin County. Well, let's do a quick review of your backgrounds, though, so we can update our listener on that. And I know I did a little bit of background, but obviously I can't cover everything and probably not eloquently say it as well. But Auditor Stenziano, let's begin by starting by sharing your background and your path to the auditor's office. Sure. Appreciate it. Although you did cover a lot of it. Okay. Uh, I always start just a kid from Columbus. So grew up down the street, which meant when I was 18, my goal was to leave Ohio, potentially never come back, but I have returned. <laughs> uh, came back, got a lot of great Ohio State, uh, had the opportunity uh, to work for then Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner uh, and her legal counsel office and the Secretary of State's office that led to becoming director of the Board of Elections. Good quirk to Ohio law, though. You can't both run elections and run for office. So February 18, 2010, I resigned uh, and then began the public uh, service path uh, that you noted. Uh, proud father of an eight and six-year-old. And here we are and in the auditor's office. We're in our fourth year uh, of a new administration and really tackling the challenges uh, th- th- as best we can. Okay. Four years. It went fast. It, a pandemic does that to everything. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, but it does go by fast. The mystery two years, exactly. <laughs> Katie, you've been the guiding light for the age-friendly movement in our community for over six years. But there may be some news to convey today. You know, Tell us a little bit about your journey to the in through the aging arena. Sure. So um, I actually studied gerontology at Ohio State, which is kind of unique. The major didn't last long, but um, have always worked in aging and had a passion and a love for this area. So started my career um, working in assisted living and covered um, a number of different spaces in long-term care. Um, Had a role at the Alzheimer's Association, um, helped launch the first village in town, which is a small uh, neighborhood-based non 
nonprofit, um, and then took on Age Friendly. So um, I like to say that I've been all across the aging continuum and have enjoyed every piece of that. Um, and the latest news is that come June, I will be the director of the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging. Congratulations. And, and I have to say, Cindy's podcast was a really great prep for my interview process. <laughs> so I appreciated that so much. <laughs> she, she did a wonderful job she in did. telling us to look forward mm-hmm. um, in that. And so thanks very much and congratulations. Thank you. And big shoes to fill, big but shoes to you fill. can do this. Exactly. I, I think so. Thank yes. you. <laughs> and you have a, a, a shout out to COAAA. They are an incredible team. They it's are. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very lucky. So Great. Great. Well, I imagine that as individuals try to understand property taxes, responsibilities of home ownership and the financial impact, there are many glassy-eyed Franklin County residents. Over the past few years in this housing cost explosion and reevaluations of property values, it became clear that taxes are going to rise. Um, Auditor Stenziano, your office heard the stories. Can you give us an overview of what was being reported and the impact, you know, particularly on older homeowners regarding tax increases? You know, we've heard the term food instability, but now we're witnessing individuals on the cusp of losing their homes as well. So really early in the auditor administration, uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty had a affordable housing program uh, over at the Lincoln Theater and quickly turned into a big discussion on property taxes Mm. and and the concern uh, and very real feeling that people felt they were going to be property taxed out of their neighborhood. And so in the auditor's role, while we do not issue the property tax bill and you do not pay the property tax bill to the auditor, uh, serving as the chief property assessor is one of the pieces of the puzzle that establishes your property tax bill. So you get your appraised value plus your taxing district gets us to the property taxes. And and as you mentioned, hot real estate market, property values are going up. That's what you want. You actually don't want property values to go down. Mm -hmm. Uh, But tying that in a very generous community that supports our libraries, that supports a numbering of schools, uh, tax entities, uh, that's where the property taxes continue to go up. And so what we continue to hear was kind of that mantra, and it's always been at the forefront, is how can we best make sure folks are not property taxed out of their homes? Couple that with, we are required every three years to do a reevaluation of some sort. Uh, So in 2020, it was the triennial. It's looking at real estate sales and update based on Department of Taxation at the state level's recommendations or a mass reappraisal, which we'll have coming up in 2023. But it is all directed towards what uh, real estate activity is going on. And so if you're an older resident and you've paid off your home, we hear consistently concerns of I am paying more in my property taxes now than I ever did on my mortgage. I'm on a fixed income. What can we be doing? Why is this occurring? And so always happy to educate people on what the law requires, uh, but also to seek solutions and really wanted to quantify a little more than just the one-off outreach we were receiving. So you do have an open ear to this? Of course. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think that's half the battle of knowing you have, as a homeowner, someone you can call and and be you're going to be listened to. Well, and, and your office has also changed some of the process where for people who want to seek a waiver or a change in that reevaluation. Well, and I know we're going to talk about the report. So what was really, to Katie's credit, she, she knew her how to reach me and said, hey, uh, we've, we've got a, a nonprofit. They're working with an older resident and they're really concerned about what activity your office did. And I said, well, Katie, we have these programs. And the response was, we didn't even know that existed. Mm-hmm. And that began a bigger conversation also of what's already in play. What can we advocate for at the state house and, and how we can make sure these processes are easy right. and common sense for older adults or any other resident in Franklin Anyone. County. And, and truly the issue is people don't know what they don't know. So that's, listeners, what we're really trying to get across today is we're going to give you some bits and pieces of information and also how to get a hold of folks who can help you through this process. Mm -hmm. So, Katie, at the same time that the auditor's office is hearing reports, your office was also hearing um, about the problems. And um, were people looking for resources? Were they looking for relief? Um, How were you able to respond sort of in the short term? And how did this report 
come about? Sure. So I think the timing of it and the sort of trust and reputation that Age Friendly has in town worked well together with the auditor and I having um, previous experience working together on a lot of projects. So when we started to hear these concerns, you know, people were saying, hey, this is going on. Clients I work with are really worried. Um, we know that you guys are the right place to go and kind of share these concerns because that's what we do. We, we, we gather the concerns and then we go do the advocacy or the research needed. And so really to the auditor's credit, it was the same day that we had this conversation that you were like, let's figure out a way that you guys can can work on a report to quantify this. And so um, it was a really – eye-opening process, we came at it from a couple different lenses. So what is the research and data nationally out there show us? What are people doing? How are they getting it right? What is our local um, census information telling us? What's our local data saying? And then we did a series of subject matter expert interviews with people um, that were older homeowners, older renters, and then professionals working with older adults as well. So we tried to really think about it in a number of different ways so that we could get so much information in one report um, as our foundation that we can, you know, we can build on this, we can grow on this. But um, it took us about a year. And um, this is really complicated work. I mean, even getting up to speed, and I probably still can't really speak off the cuff about it, but about property tax and tax law and who does what, right? That's hard. So mm-hmm. um, it's a nice, big, robust report. And that was really purposeful to make sure we got this strong foundation for where we need to go for solutions. Yeah. Well, this report, which will include a link on the website uh, to the, the on the podcast episode for this, is a thorough look at the demographic and financial data available as well as a, a great overview of anecdotal information and survey responses from the community. Uh, Katie, let's discuss the key findings of the report as you are analyzing the demographic and the financial data. Um, you know, who and how many are affected in the county, both owners and renters? How does Franklin County measure up against other counties and across the nation? As you mentioned, you took it a big scale and you, and you zeroed down as well too. So what are some key findings? Sure. So um, first and foremost, we know, and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot on the podcast, people want to stay in their homes as they age, right? Whether it's a freestanding home or a condo or a low income um, apartment, they want to be able to stay in place. And so that was loud and clear again through our local and national data. Um, This sort of age old story of the have and the have nots is continues to be true. And so when we talk about individuals um, as they age, there is a group that is doing really financially well and they're going to be okay. Um, there's kind of a group in the middle that may be saved and, and might have a little challenges if something comes up. And then there's a big growing group that is saving less um, than ever repo- before, carrying in more debt into retirement, um, more mortgages than than ever before. Um, and so we're seeing this increasing challenge just in the finances of things. Um, but then even further down the pike when we think about, okay, maybe I do want to move. Maybe I do want to sound size. We just don't have enough units. We don't have enough affordable or low-income housing available. So we start to kind of see the squeeze happening. And when you look at the next part of the housing continuum, not enough options there. Um, We've got a lot of folks that are housing cost burdened. So that means they're paying 30% or more of their income on housing costs alone. And so... um, we know that individuals 65 and older that are household owners are 23% are housing cost burden and renters, um, 57% of older renters are housing cost burden. So those are huge numbers, right? Um, I'm not sure how much more into this you want me to go, but the fa- the last thing um, I want to make sure that I mention is that um, the – a lot of the programs and resources are based on the poverty level, right? So you have to meet 100, 150% of the poverty level. And we found this really interesting body of work called the Elder Index. And it actually takes a more holistic look at individuals' needs and what they need to be making ends meet. Um, and in Franklin County, that's about $35,484, um, which is much higher than the federal poverty line. And so even though um, you can qualify at, at a certain level that the federal poverty line, we really actually are seeing you need much more than that to even be able to make ends meet. So we've got a lot of gaps in services and a lot of um, areas that we think um, can be closed up by new programs. You know, this is not necessarily a new problem, and it's not a, just a pandemic problem. 
this has been going on you know, for a while. Um, there, when I was reading through the report, and I actually did read the report, it is ah, excellent, okay. excellent. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Um, two things caught my attention, and you've sort of discussed those just now. The first is it's not going to go away. The boomer generation mm -hmm. is affected now, but the next three generations between now and is it 2040, there are going to be twice the number of people in Franklin County at 65 and older. Right. So it's not it's not like it's going to be a quick problem, right? It's going right. to be a problem and it's going to stay a problem. Well, and and if we go back to the Scripps gerontology program um, maps that they put out 10 years ago, it's showing counties in Ohio where they are already at 25, 35 percent older adults. And in the next 15 years for them, it's going to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just going to. So this is not going to go away. It's not just. A Franklin County issue. It's really it's a national issue, but Central Ohio is is greatly impacted. The other thing that I was uh, that caught my eye in the report that I can remember my parents and my aunts and uncles, everyone trying to pay off their mortgage before they retired. Mm -hmm. That was the goal. You worked until you could pay off your mortgage. That's not happening now. People are not able to save. They're not paying off mortgage, and it may not. It's not that they're not paying their mortgage, but maybe they had more than one house, so they have refinanced over time. Um, they may have um, had situations in which they couldn't pay a lot more on their house, so they were paying minimally what they had to pay. Mm -hmm. Interest rates were for a while very high. Now, they were low for a long time and going back up, but there were there are a lot of reasons that people hadn't What's going on? What is happening that these situations have even come about? Well, one of the reasons is um, right as a large group of individuals retired, the the Great Recession hit, right? right? And so then a lot of folks are borrowing against the value that they had in their home just to make ends meet. And so that was a, that's a huge um portion of individuals that were affected by that. But then in general, just less going into retirement with less savings and more debt than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll get on my soapbox around ageism. And so if you don't want to grow old and you're not willing to start thinking about how to best grow old, which means you might not be saving, right? And there's obviously complex issues within that. But um, we aren't talking about growing old in the right ways early mm -hmm. enough and thinking about how much you really need to save in order to be able to age in the way that you want to. You brought up a good point. When the recession hit, mm -hmm. when we were all trying to help people find jobs, there was an issue with um, people who were not 65 taking out Social Security as soon as they hit 62. So they were losing money on Social Security. And maybe as opposed to doing that, they were doing those second mortgages. They could have paid off their house mm -hmm. and ended up with a new mortgage. So, yeah, good point. Thank and you. not to mention, I mean, Social Security is not keeping pace with with right. the cost of living, right? right? And so even if you did retire and you had a pretty good nest egg and you were relying on Social Security, maybe a little bit more retirement, none of that's keeping pace with, with how expenses and, and um, the cost of living right. increases. Right. Yeah. Well, Auditor Stenziano, there are several programs in your office that were created to help homeowners in the tax rate that they were assessed, such as a homestead exemption program, poverty tax assistant program. Um, can you give us an overview of those programs? Are they widely used? What well, can be done to strengthen those and other programs? So you, you hit the, the most popular ones, the homestead exemption. Yeah. And it's one that was created in the early 80s that was meant for older residents. Uh, in the 80s, it was both an income and age component to qualify. And it provided a percent reduction uh, for those that qualified. When Governor Strickland became governor, he got rid of the economic component, and it was just age-based. And a lot of Ohioans took advantage of that. Governor Kasich came in, he added the economic component again, and what we have seen, and, and all those that had qualified before were grandfathered in. So immense amount of growth, and then it has just dropped off. And it, as Katie and we've talked about, our population, our older resident population is growing, and we're seeing less and less qualifying because the economic component has not grown with inflation. Mm -hmm. it, it is pretty stagnant. And so 
Uh, it is an important program. We want every resident that qualifies for it to take advantage of it. Uh, but we also hear a lot of frustration of two working households. Uh, they're just above the threshold, still on that fixed income. And so while their property tax may be going up, uh, they're not able to receive that benefit, which I think was a grand bargain that the General Assembly over time has uh, moved and uh, addressed. To that end, then we have the Property Tax Assistant Program, uh, affectionately known as PTAP. It's actually been around about three decades. Uh, and in this case, a lot of residents don't take advantage of it. They're not aware. Uh, historically, it has not had adequate funding. Uh, so the individuals, nonprofits that were behind uh, supporting it and administering it uh, kept it kind of quiet. It is a one-time opportunity. One time uh, is the key feature of it for someone that may have a change of circumstance that needs assistance to pay their property taxes. Uh, and again, there's qualifying components, but not enough residents take advantage of it. It's just because it wasn't publicized. We're very proud to have worked with County Commissioner Eric Crowley and the rest of the Board of Commissioners, O'Grady and Boyce, uh, to pump up that funding. So over the next two years, there's $80,000 in the pool uh, for qualifying individuals. And so we want to uh, use all of those dollars and make sure it is taken advantage of. And then the other one that is highlighted in the report actually falls in the Treasurer's Office. It's not a relief per se, but uh, you can establish a property tax uh, payment plan instead of getting that bill and having to pay it all at once, staggering it out uh, over the year or whatever the payment plan terms are, uh, is something that's in play, it's available. We don't think a lot of people take advantage of it because they don't know about it either. Uh, I know our age-friendly innovation folks have really wanted to see uh, the county to highlight it more uh, based on the feedback they had from residents. That's something that everyone's like, didn't know that was a thing. That would be very helpful for our budgeting needs. And, and so those are the three programs that are in play. But we need, recognize they're limited and can grow. Very, very strong advocates of uh, expanding and modernizing the homestead exemption. Uh, there's currently seven pieces of legislation in the General Assembly to do that. So it is uh, recognized across the state, yet which one will move, which will be the vehicle, unclear. Uh, there are opportunities in other jurisdictions. Senator, uh, State Senator Herschel Craig has established a circuit breaker. So either uh, when you reach a certain age, your property taxes won't increase by a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. Again, trying to provide a level of predictability. Mm -hmm. Auditors remain concerned of, I don't want to impact my valuation. And it's working with the local taxing entities then of what do they need for their budgetary purposes and kind of the grand bargain of what voters have established for them at the ballot box. So there's a lot of work to get done. Uh, I don't think a lot of folks take advantage or are aware the programs exist outside homestead exemption. Mm -hmm. okay. So Katie, now this part of the conversation leads us right into the recommendations from mm -hmm. the report. Um, four goals were outlined. Give us a little bit more on that. Sure. So the auditor um, did a nice job teeing us up for that. So um, I'll start with the homestead exemption as well. And so not only has the homestead qualification um, not been looked at and reevaluated, but also the value of the actual benefit hasn't been changed. It's been frozen. And so if you were someone that was using it, you're actually essentially losing value year over year. Um, so we really took um, – a broad approach in looking at the homestead exemption in a number of different ways that that might be updated. Now, that is a statewide program, right? So that requires um, legislative updates. And so that's a that's a big uphill battle. Um, but the good news is, as the auditor mentioned, there are a number of different bills sort of in motion. And we spent some time out in Gahanna with older adults and um, in other communities around Franklin County. There are a lot of older people that would be more than willing to kind of jump on board with an advocacy piece too here. So um, it's a tough one, but we felt it was really important to get in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's goal number one is increasing the the value and the rate of use of the homestead exemption. Then we looked at PTAP. So the auditor talked about the property tax assistance program. So originally it was conceptualized to serve the individuals uh, of lowest income and highest need in a crisis. And it was great and it was doing really great things. The problem is the number of individuals that are low income experiencing a crisis has skyrocketed. And so while the program was serving this, this small original need, um, the need actually grew ex exponentially. And so um, to, to the auditor's credit and to the commissioner's credit, they actually 
um, awarded more money just in the last cycle than I think almost in the 29-year history combined. And so that's monumental change, right? Um, That's huge. So part of our recommendations here is to really take a good look at these next couple of funding cycles and do some deep analysis on, um, you know, what are the average income levels and what type of crises are going on here? Because what we think might be occurring here is PTAP will always be for – emergencies, right? But we might need to look at creating another new program for individuals that are going to have long-term difficulty paying for for their property taxes, not just the one time. Um, He mentioned the budget payment plan. So we spent a lot of time talking to individuals that applied for PTAP because we thought, what a better way than to jump in and really and talk to some people. And most phone calls, people were like, "What? There's a property ta- or there's a there's a budget payment plan? We didn't know about that. We'd love to do that because mm-hmm. it's a hardship to pay twice a year a big lump sum. And if right. you can be kind of chipping away at it, um, that's a huge resource. So we want to lean into that. Um, and really, all of those kind of lead to our goal number four, which is just increasing awareness and understanding. And I think that's the same for a lot of aging services. Um, but but you don't know what you don't know, um, right. sometimes until it's too late, right? And so really thinking about who are the big players, the, the Life Care Alliances, the COAAA, FCOA, the case managers in town, and the social workers and the villages. How do we get in front of everybody and really make sure everyone knows about these key resources? So as we're trying to make some big transformational changes, we make sure we're also boots on the ground, getting more people connected to the programs as they exist today. Right. One, one of the things that I thought was interesting in the report, I hadn't even thought about it, as opposed to not having that payment plan and having to make these huge payments twice a year, if you don't make it, even though you could do it on a payment plan, if you don't make those that those large payments, you're shown as delinquent. Correct. So if not only to have those payment plans on a monthly or biweekly basis, but also not show that, that you're delinquent on your taxes. Right. Huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. So, Well, how did the survey and the the responses from professionals in mm-hmm. the aging arena mm-hmm. guide the report and recommendations? Because you mentioned a lot about, you know, the surveys, you went out with individuals, you talked to them and, and got some really good feedback. Did um, you get some feedback and, and input from professionals in the aging arena about this? We did. We found some common themes when talking to professionals. Um, One of the themes that really spoke to me was um, sort of this emotional experience in working with people who are going through a crisis, and that crisis is around losing their home. And just, I don't want to say emotional burden, but it's something close to that where um, every professional we talked to just talked about going to great lengths to find any resource here or there to connect someone to to protect that house. Um, Because you're on the phone or you're in person talking to folks and it's you end up being potentially the bearer of bad news right and so it's really difficult and it's a taxing position to be in and so again that's where some of our education comes into play and making sure people know what resources exist um so of course some of the common themes were around how much housing costs are increasing how housing is central to well-being and how much people want to stay in their home um there was a lot of conversation about the lack of not only quote unquote affordable housing, but low income housing and how, yes, there's more affordable housing being built, but affordable now is actually a higher income than most of the folks we're talking about in this report. And so really just sort of being, I don't know, almost gridlocked in, I want to stay in my home, but I can't, and there's no other options. And so there's almost this um, sort of leap from having a home to facing homelessness, right? And so we we don't have enough in the middle to support a really smooth transition. And so, um, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of um, crisis-oriented, you know, the volume and severity of crisis-oriented calls. We kept hearing that. Many more calls and many more very serious calls occurring. You know, it, it seems that when you hear the word affordable, Everybody has their own perception of what yes. affordable is. Yes. And as long as we have an $8 minimum wage in this country, people are going to think somebody can live on $8 an hour. Um, it's amazing when you're reading through the report to see how you can, with this index you were using, how the issues that 
seniors face that they may not have faced in the past. Um, medical, medical procedures, medical doctor's appointments, medicine itself, let alone the cost of gas or yeah. in the cost of your car, the cost of insurance on your car so that you can get to all those appointments. All those things are getting mixed up together. And as you said, $35,000, people can't live on that anymore. Right. Right. And even that's higher than, you know, the 150% of the... Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, so when folks say they want at least $15 an hour, even that is just barely right hitting what they need to do the basic minimum. So... Um, they're not going to have a mortgage on a house because they're never going to be able to save a down payment, which is uh, one thing we haven't really talked about is this doesn't just affect individuals who are directly paying property taxes, but for renters mm-hmm. who are in homes in, in and buildings and that the taxes have gone up, that's just going to get pushed into a higher rent for them. So whether you're renting or you own your home, buying your home, you're still going to have the same issue. Yeah. So, Auditor Cinziano, now that the report's been disseminated, um, what are the next steps? What are, what can we do directly? What can the commissioners do? Um, what needs to go to the state legislature? So a lot uh, is going to rely on the state legislature, and so advocacy remains key. Uh, the report helps tell the story uh, a lot better, uh, even when I'm meeting with my colleagues across state uh, and other county auditors. Everyone's got one or two individuals, but really proud of the report to quantify Uh, and tell the story in a more compact, even though it's a big report, uh, more (laughs) compact way uh, than just kind of uh, one-on-one stories that people may have heard. Uh, But, you know, the report really puts uh, some emphasis on what we can be doing in the office better. Uh, That was always one of the challenges as we hear from older adults, are we responding in the right manner and the right way, Mm -hmm. recognizing their circumstances are going to be different than some maybe other Bob and Betty Buckeyes who may engage the office. Uh, And so it's continuing to advocate for the funding, continuing to advocate for the appropriate policy changes. But then for any property owner, having them work with our office ahead of time. It it remains not a point of frustration, but we understand it. We don't hear from folks so they get that property tax bill. Mm -hmm. And so much uh, of what's gone on that leads to that can help address some of the concerns that we hear. And and so is it, do I qualify for this tax exemption? Uh, Is there a program that exists? Do I need to be looking at a payment plan? Where can I advocate? All those are actions that we can do well before that property tax bill hits, the eyes get big, and then they start in calling the office. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, as we've talked about, this is not an easy subject to understand. It's it's a tome (laughs) of of research, which is great. Uh, Katie, how is your office going to work with the auditor's office to continue to study the issue, you know, disseminate information, and possibly create new resources? One goal in the report is to place a social work expert in the auditor's office. Any other opportunities available to create new pathways of information to get out to the community? Yeah, so I'll start by answering, start by saying um, we thought and and thought pretty hard and had conversations with the auditor's office about doing this report um, and ultimately knew that it wasn't just going to re- be a report that sat on the shelf, right, that people say, you know, um, as a council member, as an auditor, I think... Michael's really good about taking on things and then being serious about implementing them. So we tried to have some lofty goals, and then we tried to have um, some goals that we knew we could get right off the bat. So we'll start by doing some trainings, like I said, to social workers, case managers across Franklin County to make sure they know about Homestead, about PTAP, about the budget payment plan. Mm -hmm. That's sort of... um, it doesn't seem real flashy and fun, but it's it's baseline and it's foundational, and we think that will be key. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, we think getting a social worker in any office anywhere is almost <laughs> always a goal that we set out. But, yeah, we do think having an expert um, in the auditor's office – and actually, I believe you just hired someone um, that's policy program expert, so, so really just as good around thinking about how to beef up um, – team members in the auditor's office so that when uh, when this influx of calls and challenges happens, it's maybe a little bit less um, stressful and, and hard on the staff that's already there, right? Because you've got your staff, your social work expert on staff, in theory. <laughs> that wasn't me trying to get a job at your office. Um, I don't think I can afford you. That. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with her new degree in hand, right? <laughs> um 
So I think those are our big ones. We need to start, and this is, again, common to a lot of the aging resources. We need to make sure that we're educating each other on what we do. And, and just as much as we need to get the, the auditor and housing information out there, we also need to get the aging information into the auditor's office as well. Well, if we go back to the beginning of Age Friendly Columbus, mm-hmm. and when we were looking at all of those bits and pieces to make that project happen, one of the huge main issues was communication. Right. How do we get information out to the aging population as well as to those who serve the aging population? So it sounds like in some ways there already is a network built. Yes. Um, but it's this is <laughs> this is incredible information to try to teach everybody. It is. One other thing I'd like to just kind of chat about is before we released this report to the public, we brought together a group of older adults. We got the report in their hands ahead of time and had them read it and just say, did we get this right? Did we cover it all? Do you think we're going in the right direction? Um, And I think overwhelmingly so, the group was really supportive. But a couple of things they said was, this is big. This is going to take more than one conversation. But they also said, come out to the community. You know, I've got my friends down the street and I'd love for them to hear this. And Mm -hmm. I've got my church. And I think church members would hear that. And so not only kind of this network of professionals, but I think we're doing a good job of engaging, um, you know, older adult ambassadors where if they're the trusted person in the community and they say this report is important, you should hear from the auditor and age friendly, then we can go out and meet these smaller groups Mm -hmm. where they exist too. Well, you've both used the word advocacy. If somebody is listening to this podcast and they're like, okay, which legislators do I need to talk to? Or, you know, and that's a that's a huge barrel of fish. Uh, <laughs> and so how would you describe your your ideas on what an individual can do to make this work? I mean, so I chuckle because we have these conversations all the time and, and people leave and say, you know what? I am going to contact my state rep. Right. I'm going to call Sherrod Brown right now. Exactly. And we point out Sherrod Brown's not a state rep. He's a U.S. <laughs> senator. Uh, and that's not the area where we need the advocacy. It, it, it's, it, it really is as simple as learning who your state rep, state senator are. That's where a lot of these programs uh, are stagnant at uh, in telling and sharing the story of, you know, particularly for older residents saying, you know, I, I understand property values are going to go up, but if you tie it to property taxes and I'm on a fixed income, this is the impact it's going to have. Uh, those stories f- still aren't being uh, as reached into the state house and, and being uh, shared like we would like to see. But it really is just learning who your state rep, state senator are, contacting them when they're in the office. Oftentimes they have community hours, they have Uh, different forums. That's where Joyce Beatty had a great group kind of highlighting these issues and just making sure they understand and not waiting every three years when there's evaluation going on or not waiting the two times a year where you get your property tax bill um, because those systems are in place. That's the administrative Mm -hmm. process. But to get those changes, those elected officials need to understand even further the impact the current structure has on people's lives. Well, And and they want to hear the stories. I, 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 you know, we may think they don't, but I think they really do want to hear the stories. Absolutely. So, so Katie, I, I, we, we always give our guests an opportunity to give their words of wisdom before we close. However, I have another question okay. I'm throwing in at you that's not on the list. Okay, I'm ready. Um, so we described your job with Age Friendly as having lots of bits and pieces and components to it, including the Age Friendly Innovation Center. Yes. So is that like now the new umbrella of all the Age Friendly programs? It is. Yeah. Oh, great question. Okay. This one I can answer. I was nervous. Um, Yeah. So the Age Friendly Innovation Center is actually a center of Ohio State's College of Social Work, meaning we went through an application process and faculty had to vote on it. And it's really a deeper dedication to research and engagement and education and allows us to kind of have a a bigger footprint and ability to apply for different grants and um, just some good notoriety, right, across universities, being being a university or college center really means something. So yes, tucked underneath the Age Friendly Innovation Center um, is Dr. Holly DeBelco Shoney, our director of research, uh, the director position, which I'm in, and then Marisa Sheldon, who's the assistant director of interdisciplinary student engagement. So um, we continue to run and manage the Age Friendly Columbus and Franklin County projects. And actually on May 24th, we'll be rolling out our Central Ohio Regional Assessment on Aging data. So you might want to have that. Them come on and talk about that. But we did an eight-county um, 
assessment, much like we did in 2016. But and there's a webinar. There's correct? a webinar. Mm -hmm. And so we will put a link on our show notes oh, for the thank webinar. You. So that yeah. if anybody's interested, because um, I signed up, so oh, everybody good. may want to join me. And one really cool thing that we're doing, we invested in a data dashboard. So the information, all the data will be out there so that individuals can access that. If you are right. writing grants or if you need to do advocacy, you can go right online and, you know, kind of move all that information around to get what you need. So one of my... Um, huge issues has always been making sure that um, young people have opportunities for professional development and internships and and as well as older individuals who are re-entering the workforce who may also want to have professional development opportunities. The Innovation Center, is that a great place for students to help? Yes. I f I'm like smiling really big and yes. you can't see that on a podcast. Um, yes, it's a great center. So yes. Marisa has been um, an incredible leader in creating what we have, the Age-Friendly Innovation Scholars Program. And so it's students from all across the university, not just social work. We've got sitting regional planning, public health, um, occupational therapy, um, but they come through and they spend a full semester and they learn all about the aging network. They get connected to folks in town. They learn about age friendly. And when they leave and go into their profession, they've got that aging and accessibility lens for their right. career. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Wonderful. So now I'm going to give you the opportunity for some words of wisdom. About general life or about property no, taxes? About property taxes. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, you could throw in general life and under property taxes <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> Drink a lot of water and sleep a lot. No. Um, okay. Have you been doing that recently? Is that no, right? neither. <laughs> That's why it's my advice for others. Um, okay. So my advice um, in regard to this work and this report is to start thinking about things early. If you're wanting to stay in your home, kind of look up, see what programs are out there that you might uh, be able, eligible for. Um, and I would say it takes a village. And so not only thinking about finances, but thinking about your social network. And again, if your goal is to stay in your home, um, start building that social network in case you need a little something, maybe be open to having a roommate, who knows, but think not only for the financial planning, but think about your social planning and how you're going to make sure that that all works out too. Right. And it's not just for you as an individual older adult, but it's for your kids to hear this information so they can help you prepare that village that you need in order to stay in your home. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Auditor Stenziano, uh, this is your, your uh, opportunity. I, I will piggyback on the kind of uh, think ahead. Uh, one of the challenges is we don't hear from folks early enough that the circumstances or they get that property tax bill and that's when the eyes really open up to what's out there, how can I handle this? And there's so much uh, engagement that can occur ahead of time. So mm -hmm. encourage people to contact the auditor's office uh, anytime. Uh, understand even with some of the kind of financial education, if you're going to buy a home, here's where you will continue to have payments, not just on maintenance, uh, but the right. property tax component. Uh, and then obviously you can be advocating every day uh, for those changes. A lot of other states uh, come off – a little more age friendly or receptive and understanding their older adult population than the current structure and system we have. And so advocating for those changes uh, is something that we can do now to benefit us all later. Can I slip a call to action in? Yeah, Absolutely. Love a call to action. Okay, here's my call to action. It's going to take a lot of um, cross-sector leadership and participation for us to really get to the crux of um, housing stability, mm -hmm. especially for older adults. And so if you work in housing, if you're in something tangential, you know, come – contact us. Um, this report is the foundation. It's the starting point. There's a hundred other things that we learned while doing this report in other directions that we need to um, do some further research. But if you're interested, if you're affected, if you work in this area, um, give us a call or an email and, and help us get it done. Great. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. Uh, listener, don't forget to check the show notes. We're going to have connections on all this stuff as well as on our podcast website. We'll have information and resources for you to lessen your housing cost burden. Let us know your thoughts on this podcast or any other episode. We look forward to talking to you very soon.